Hello, my friends across the fruited and rooted plain. It's time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson, as we broadcast from the beautiful Studio A at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. And yes, things are in flower here. We hope things are blooming where you're at. Stacy, to start things off today, let's talk plant variegation foliage variegation. The other day I was walking through the greenhouse and I took a look at Wajila. I pronounced that right. Wajila, right? Yes. 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 Uh, Vino Verde. Oh yeah. And this is a really cool plant. Now for folks who are watching us on YouTube, you'll see this pop up. It has lime green leaves and a bold black margin. When you talk about variegation and foliage, this is a beauty. It's very unique. There are yeah. there's really not very many other plants that look like it, and it keeps the variegation all season, which doesn't always happen. So uh, it is a very bold and very different look. You know, I think, and I'm sure you're going to get to this, but variegation is a very polarizing topic. Oh my word, is it ever? And we will get to that. You know, when you think of foliage variegation, one of the first plants that comes to mind, of course, are hostas. There are many oh, yes. proven winners has their shadow land. Uh, hostas like etched glass liberty or mighty mouse uh, these are all hostas that uh, have that variegation or you look at one of my favorites in the landscape pulmonaria and its splotchy mm. foliage uh, but with variegation in the landscape you're so right stacy that you have to be careful or selective because for me if too much variegation is used in the landscape it just gets too busy and it and it and it bothers me visually. And you know, the people who love variegation though, they tend to love variegation. <laughs> and so they pile it on. And I, I I kind of think that variegation is is like an all or nothing ordeal. Like you're either going like one carefully placed variegated plant right. or you're just like pouring it on and making some sort of variegated wonderland, which I have seen work. Yeah. It's not everybody's taste. It but, does work. Um, you you know, it's uh, it it's it makes a, a lot of people I think appreciate sort of the quietness of the garden mm -hmm. and variegated plants, not quiet. Yeah, the eye needs a place to rest, and variegation can get kind of busy. But again, this is controversial. You know, a few weeks ago we we got controversial with the whole cilantro thing. So yes. let's jump right back in here and talk about variegation. Now it can be argued that plant breeders have an interest in variegation because of the economic value of variegation in certain plants. And this is something that I experienced with houseplants in the industry, uh, especially 2018 to 2021. Of course, there was the houseplant craze and people wanted their calatheas, their aglaonemas, their pothos, all kinds of plants. And this year's houseplant of the year, feeling flirty, uh, is a variegated yeah. uh, plant. But it was really philodendrons and monstera that took it to the next level and these were like genetic mutations it almost became like tulip mania uh, in yeah. holland in the 1600s when these viral infections would cause variations and variegations and then of course uh, people would borrow money against their house or whatever it is and then the market collapsed and well we all know what happens that bubble burst but uh, it was kind of like that because some of the prices that that I was seeing out there for a variegated monstera was crazy yeah it was it was yeah it was tulip mania kind of it stuff. was tulip mania kind of stuff and then it and still then, is I think uh, you still see yeah. those things I I'll see on Facebook some local greenhouse say We've got three, you know, Thai Constellation, Monstera or whatever. And, you know, they're $180. Come and get them before they're gone. Yeah. And, and they'll be gone. And talk about the, uh, uh, just just talk about the whole cilantro thing and the controversy. Same here with the houseplants because the pink Congo philodendron mm -hmm. came along where uh, people eventually determined that this plant was not variegated because the plant wanted to be variegated, but People made it variegated and uh, in color, and the variegation would not last, and that created, uh, boy, a whole big uh, ta-da. 
But it does bring up a point, and I wanted to ask your opinion, Stacy, on variegation in foliage. People will often ask me, hey, can low light conditions cause a variegated plant to lose its pattern and, and turn green? What do, you, what do you think about that? Yes, it can. It okay. absolutely can. So, uh, and similarly, high light conditions can cause variegation to burn or, you know, scorch. Um, and yeah, because basically variegation can be a couple of different things. You can have gold variegation, you can have white variegation. Um, and like we were talking about purple and black, there's a lot of different ways, pink that it can manifest different shades of green even, but generally when you're dealing with like the yellow or white variegation, Mm -hmm. the white is a lack of chlorophyll. There are no chlorophyll cells in that white portion. That's why it's white. In the case of the yellow variegation, there is a, a different plant pigment rather than chlorophyll or some chlorophyll and mostly the yellow uh, plant pigment and that l- chlorophyll is basically a plant sunscreen. Sure. You know, it's, it's the part right. of the plant that makes, uh, energy from sunlight, but it also works as a sunscreen for the plant. So if you don't, if it's not getting enough sun, then that can cause it to, you know, it's not going to be as vivid. It will go right. kind of a muddy. And if it's getting too much, that can cause it to burn because it doesn't have that sunscreen. And it's very common. And I'm sure you've seen this in the garden center industry as well. Um, for plants when they come out of poly houses or greenhouses, or if you order plants by mail and you take them out of the box, anytime they've been in those lower light conditions, they're not experiencing the full spectrum of sunlight that brings that variegation to the forefront. But that doesn't mean it's not there. It returns once it gets into yeah, you know, that's good fantastic. light conditions. So there you have it, folks. It's not a fig leaf of your imagination. That is a real thing. Now, I have favorites. Uh, of course, I love the cordylines, the tropical plant cordylines. I love caladiums like the heart-to-heart caladiums. That's just a riot of color on foliage. And in our annual containers, variegated Swedish ivy uh, is a plectranthus, which is, uh, in my opinion, a great choice and and of course sweet potato vines something like sweet potato vines even that has gotten into the act with a tricolor yeah. sweet potato vine a lot of people like that one because it's a little bit smaller and less rambunctious than yes. a lot of the other sweet potato vines now as i understand it there are different types of variegation there is genetic variegation where it's simply passed down it's in the dna of the plant and then the next type of variegation i'm so happy to have stacy seated next to me because i can't pronounce this i think it's chimeric or chimeric or chimeric i've heard it key chi or ka and i really don't care anymore it's spelled c h i m E-R-I-C, but that's kind of a random occurring and not predictable uh, variegation in plants. Then we have blister or reflective variegation. One of my favorites is satin pothos uh, or silver splash. So it's a variegation formed by air pockets that exist between the outer leaf layer and the inner pigmented layer of the plant. Uh, And then I'm going to throw in the fourth type, and that is artificial, where people make the plant variegated, but it's not going to last. In other words, inject something into the plant. I have seen that with uh, painted succulents or the uh, the pink Congo philodendron or or variations in orchids. Well, you know, it's it's important to understand that variegation is a mutation. It's not, you know, in nature, very few plants are just going to, you know, emerge from the seed as a variegation. Right. Most typically what happens is that they emerge as a sport. So you've got a plant, it's all green. And then one day you walk out and you're like, holy macaroni, there's a variegated branch. Holy Uh, macaroni. (laughs) There's a a variegated branch on my plant. (laughs) And um, it's just that that little part of the plant has flipped its genes. And um, that's how most of our variegated plants end up getting to us. Although uh, sometimes that is not always stable. So what happens is a plant breeder will take that cutting and try to grow it, but very often it's not stable. It will revert. Mm. And very often when you have uh, variegated plants, you'll find some green shoots coming out here and there as it tries to revert or go back to its all green form. Mm. Interesting. So again, these sports can be very valuable and interesting and provide new plants and variegation within your landscape. But again, probably proceed with caution. However, however, caution as far as overdoing it is concerned, my opinion. However, coming up in Plants on Trial, we're going to talk about a variegated plant that I like 
in mass. Oh, all right. Yeah. And that's coming up next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's the part of the show where we put a plant on trial. We talk about one of the 320 proven winners, Color Choice Shrubs, and you decide if you're going to give it a try in your garden or not. Now, Rick, at the beginning of the show, we were talking about um, variegation, and you said you like it. So Mm -hmm. I have a question for you. Does that make you a sports fan? I am a sports fan. (laughs) Good one, Stacy. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Well done. <laughs> and today's plant on trial is, of course, variegated. I don't have a response to that. I'm just <laughs> letting you have your moment. Thanks. <laughs> it's, you know, when it's extreme horticultural humor, I'm not sure that many people <laughs> will get it, even though they may have just heard it. But, you know, I'm cracking myself up over here. So, I love it. I love it. But, yeah, it's, of course, it's a variegated plant for today's plant on trial. And, you know, last week we talked about a newer plant, Double Play Doozy spirea today we are talking about an old favorite that's been a part of the proven winners line for many many years and that is my monet wygela i love it and mr what was it Vigel would be proud was it Vigel? yes mr Vigel? yes he would be proud yeah, he'd be proud is yeah wygela has come a long way mm. since the first uh plain wygela came out and you know we have a number of variegated wygela rick you mentioned vino verde which has a, a bit of an unconventional variegation We've got a new one called Bubbly Wine that will be out next year. Um, But I wanted to go back to the classic, and that is My Monet, because there had been some variegated Wygela on the market before, but really nothing like My Monet. I'm sure you remember when it came out. I mean, it really was a sensation because there there wasn't anything like it. First of all, its variegation is so pretty. It's um, a a really nice mint green in the center with a pure white margin. And that margin, or when we say margin, we mean the outer edge of the leaf. Uh, And that takes on pink tones during cool weather. So in spring, it can have pink and white and that beautiful mint green all at once. So in addition to this gorgeous variegation, it actually is a very good bloomer. It has quite a lot of pink flowers that go perfectly with it. Some plants, variegated plants, when they flower, uh, the flowers actually detract from the variegation. They're not really doing much. In the case of my Monet, they absolutely accentuate it. And it is a dwarf Wygela. So for many, many years, Wygela were huge plants uh, that were mostly used as hedges. You know, they were six to eight feet tall, very woody, very large. And my Monet clocks in at a very diminu- diminutive one and a half feet tall and two feet wide. I love it. So I, I really do. It just, it's controlled. And uh, you mentioned the colors. I love the fact that there are hints of pink in there. Yeah. And I've always been a person who feels that pink is is a great color in the landscape because pink plays well with just about any other color. So if we're talking about a busy variegated plant, why not have some pink in the color? Yeah. And, and so it's really between the size and the color, it kind of just made people take a new look at Wygela because it could be used in a way that Wygela had not been used before. It really in its looks and in its size is almost like a perennial. And instead of thinking about it as a big landscape shrub that you have to clear out a bunch of space and takes a bunch of time to plant, you could really treat it as a perennial growing alongside, you know, things like hosta and all of these other popular perennials. And it was neat and tidy and well-behaved and, uh, and very, very beautiful. And another reason that it was kind of a game changer is why Gila has traditionally always been a full sun plant. And Wygela is, or Mamone Wygela is very much a part shade plant. You're going to want to put this thing in part sun. So, uh, you know, four to six hours of sun each day. And uh, that will really help prevent that white, again, that pure white edge, no, no chlorophyll in that. So that will help prevent it from getting sunburn. And so people who couldn't grow Wygela before all of a sudden could grow Wygela with something like my Monet. And that's part of the reason I said that I enjoy, you know, usually do not like variegated plants in mass, but my Monet, I'm, I'm willing to live with that. I think it looks, looks really, really sharp. Now, of course, Monet, and I'm reading this here, the French painter and uh, founder of Impressionist painting, uh, basically his attempts to paint nature as he perceived it, as he perceived it. And, you know, that's what we try to do in the landscape also. Each of us has different tastes, different approaches, but a plant like Mo, uh, my Monet, I think, just gives you license to, uh, to get creative. 
You know, and I have seen uh, over the years that I have been with Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs a number of very interesting plantings of my Monet. And I agree with mm-hmm. you. This is one that I think does work very well en masse. Um, it's, there's something about it that I think is a little less busy than a lot of exactly. variegated plants. It's, you know, some variegated plants, the foliage, uh, the colors are kind of all mottled and swirled together. Whereas my Monet has a very organized variegation where that, that white edge just kind of neatly, uh, goes around the green. And so it makes it much more restful. Uh, we used to have a huge mass planting of it in our trial gardens, which was lovely. And I have seen it in, um, you know, gardens in Canada and the U.S. where people have said, I just wanted you to know how much I love my Monet Wajila. And they send a picture and they've got like 50 of them. And it's, uh, yeah. it's a sight to behold. That's fantastic. fantastic. So uh, where does my Monet Wajila come from? Well, of course, not surprisingly, it comes from the Netherlands. Uh, and, you know, we've had, again, this one for a long time. And in the Netherlands, you know, over 20 years ago or so, that's where all of the plant breeding, ornamental plant breeding really was happening. And uh, so we brought this over from a breeder named Vert, Bert Verhoof. I don't know. You're, you're the one who speaks. Verhoof. That's his name. Am I mispronouncing that? You got it. Okay. Verhoof. 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 Bert Verhoof. Bert Verhoof. <laughs> uh, and so it was his work. And um, as many plants, as I said previously, many variegated plants develop. It, it was a sport off yeah. of something else. So another Wygela just puts out this random branch, whether or not that branch can then be collected and propagated and continue to grow on depends. But in the case of my Monet Wygela, fortunately, the answer is yes, that it can. And if you've grown my, my Monet Wygela before, you may find that it does shoot out some green shoots here and there. And uh, that's totally normal. Like I said, it's, you know, when something has a very, a sport is variegated from a sport, it's not always con- genetically consistently that one. There's still some of that green plant lurking around in those genes. And uh, as such, it can pop back up. And when you, when you see that happen with any variegated plant, whether it's a perennial or a shrub, you want to make sure that you remove that as soon as possible because that green shoot is all chlorophyll. So it's going to have a lot more energy than the variegated plant surrounding it, and it will easily outcompete it if it's left to its own devices. So you just want to get your pruners out, snip that out as close to the base as you can, and that will improve the look. And again, this is very common. Um, it's not something that you know people want to happen, but rare is the variegated plant that has absolutely no reversion. Now with my Monet, uh, my recommendation, Stacy, would be that often for the landscape, I look for plants with foliage color. So mm. in spring, love to plant coleus. Yes, I know the deer love the coleus too, but I love coleus simply because foliage color will just reliably give you color all season long. And you could say to a degree that you could plant my Monet similar to the way you plant coleus. And that is you're planting the foliage for season long color. Yeah. And, um, you know, it it is a plant that, again, you're going to want to give it part sun and you don't want to let it dry out. So if you have a regular, more conventional Wygela that's a big full green plant, it's going to be able to take a little drought. Now, my Monet is not one of those plants that's going to be able to take drought. If it gets stressed, it will go dormant early. Now, it won't kill the plant generally unless it's an extreme condition. But if it gets stressed, what happens is it's just like, you know what, I'm done, can't deal with this, just dropping my foliage and dropping out for the rest of the season. And you don't want that to happen because then you'll be looking at sticks and you'll think it's dead and you might take it out, which it probably isn't. So um, this is not a plant I would say to put in your most drought tolerant, hot, sunny spot. It's going to want a cooler spot. It's going to want part sun. It's going to want mulch you know, whether or not you're in a drought because mulch is extremely beneficial to all Mm -hmm. sorts of plants and regular water. And that's really going to give you the best look. Now, because it is so small, I find that it needs no pruning at all. Um, It's again, it's so tidy. The only pruning you're going to need to do is if it does put out that occasional green uh, shoot, you don't want it to revert. So you just want to take those out. Uh, It blooms on old wood. So if you do need to prune the whole thing, you're going to do that after it flowers, which is, you know, right about now in uh, early summer. And like most Vigila, quite tear resistant. I recommend planting it in your landscape. I love it. You or know, a container. It w- or a container. Uh, th- this is just a great plant. It won't take a lot of Monet to uh, afford this plant. No, it won't. I need to brush up on my plants. <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> and you that will find bad. it at your local garden center. Right now is a great time to shop for Wygela. So please do visit your local garden center. If you don't know where one is, visit provenwinnerscolorchoice.com. You can find a listing of retailers that sell our plants. And we really hope that if you have the conditions for this really unique, classic variegated Wygela, you will add it to your garden. See pictures and all the details at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. We're going to take a little break. When we come back, we open up that garden mailbag and find out what's on your mind. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardeners, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. One of the ways we like to make gardening a little bit simpler for you is to answer your gardening questions. Uh, we can pool our knowledge and experience to help you with whatever you are dealing with. So you can just email us at help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, or visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. You can check out our show notes as well as use the Contact Us tab to send a picture and your issue. And, you know, now that the gardening season is in full swing, we're definitely hearing from people with some problems. But, you know, if you don't have a problem, you just want to celebrate, that's cool too. We love to hear from you. Uh, and so let's, uh, without further ado, get to the issues that are plaguing the gardeners out there. Let's do it. Okay. Anne has a great question. I'm a gardener in zone 6A. My gardens are just coming into their own. I love the month of June when that happens, but I know just around the corner is the season I dread Japanese beetle season. They destroy everything. I purchased milky spore, but always feel like it isn't the right time to apply it. Is milky spore the best approach to breaking the cycle? If so, is it best to apply in spring, summer, or fall? Thank you. Confused in New York. Well, you know, Anne, I want to thank you so much for writing in uh, and such a great, greatly worded question. Um, you know, of course, I'm, I was aware of Milky Spore, but when I really dived in to help Anne with her question, I uh, feel like I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole, grub hole, as you were, beetle hole. Um, and I learned a lot. It, it, so it's quite interesting. So a little bit of background. Milky Spore is a bacteria. Um, it's a bacteria that was discovered in about the 1930s, and it was approved for use by the the public in 1948. So one of our earliest biological controls or using one organism to control a, a pest. So it's a living bacteria and this bacteria basically when grubs, the larval stage or baby stage of the beetle eat it. Uh, they, as they're you know feeding in the soil on roots and algae and that kind of thing, if they consume milky spore, this bacteria, it goes into their gut it multiplies and they die. And um, interestingly, milky spore can only be produced from grubs that already have milky spore. Exactly. In other words, you need a sizable grub population yes. for it to work. And even when they produce it for sale for people to apply to their lawns, they have no synthetic process. They are literally farming these grubs, taking them and somehow extracting the bacteria from these grubs that are infected with it. And that's what they're selling you. And apparently, milky spore underwent a little bit of a controversy in the 1990s where a company thought that they could make synthetic milky spore that was completely ineffective. And they put it out on the market and people were like, what's going on? And so everybody has gone back now to this in vitro production of the bacteria. Now, it's important to understand milky spore only works on Japanese beetles. So if you have other type of beetle grubs that are damaging your lawn, um, you know, there's it's sort of a two-pronged effect, right? So people want to control the adult Japanese beetles like Anne because they're eating all of your ornamentals. But the grubs do also cause damage to lawns and it's easy, it's, it's somewhat easier to control them when they're in that stage. But if you're applying it to your lawn and you have other types of grubs, not going to be effective on anything but those Japanese beetle grubs. Now, uh, it is not a true control. It's known as a population suppressant. So, uh, you know, Anne, you said that is it is this the best way to break the cycle? The answer to that is no. Um, it's not really going to break the cycle. What it's going to do is suppress the population in your yard only because you're, you know, they, they do fly. Adult Japanese beetles are, are quite able to fly pretty long distances, um, but it will help limit the number of grubs that are in your lawn to control their damage as well as the ones that emerge. And another little complicated factor here is that milky spore is really only effective 
if it's consumed at 66 to 70 degrees. So you need the soil temperatures, which uh, to have about a three-hour delay from the air temperature. Uh, you need the grubs present. You need the milky spore present. And you need it to be 66 to 70 degrees for them to actually consume it and for it to be effective and actually kill them. So I don't want to be discouraging because this is obviously a really good, easy, non-toxic way uh, but it does have a lot of caveats with it. And, you know, very often that's the case. Um, so I'm not going to discourage you from doing it, you know, especially if it's not expensive, you can put it out there. You want to put it out in spring because again, what you want, it's going to depend somewhat on your formulation and what it recommends, but you want it to be present when there are grubs that are actively feeding so that the, the bacteria can reactivate in the soil and be consumed by them. But a lot of times, especially for people in northern climates like us, you know, we may not get up to 66 to 70 degrees when those grubs are actively feeding. So it's a really complex and interesting situation. I will definitely put some resources uh, on the show notes at Gardening Simplified on air.com. But I don't think that it is the most effective way. You're going to want a multi-pronged af- approach uh, to the controlling Japanese Well, beetles. yeah, and, and the situation here is that it's the adults that are doing the damage in your landscape. So identify first the plants that they most like to munch on, like roses uh, are a plant. Uh, there are a variety of plants that the Japanese beetle adult will attack. And what I will do is I anticipate that to happen. I agree with you, Stacey, even if you're applying some type of control to your lawn, um, if your neighbors aren't, or the surrounding areas aren't, uh, adult beetles fly and you're going to have a problem. Uh, so take a look at those plants that are most susceptible in your landscape and then treat them right about the time the Japanese beetle adults uh, come out. You can use neem sprays. There's a spinosad spray that you can use. All of these things I've tried and they work out, uh, they work out quite well. Uh, I also uh, find a lot of therapeutic uh, advantage to picking them off foliage uh, uh, dumping them into soapy water. Uh, I've tried vacuuming them off that. Now that's a skill that you have to develop because you can damage foliage yeah, using a vac, a shop vac. <laughs> I could see that not going well in something like a rose. Exactly. But you know, I think that it's so important when you're dealing with pest insects, whether it's spotted lanternfly or Asiatic garden beetles or Japanese beetles, to understand that when you do handpick them, you are impacting the the population. And not in a significant way with just one, but when you look at the way they multiply over the years right. and the population goes up, it does make a difference to go ahead and handpick them. Sure, it makes a difference. And of course, the Japanese beetles as adults are feeding, they're mating, they're laying eggs in the lawn and the whole cycle starts over again. And so as a part of integrated pest management, it's also important, whatever the pest you're dealing with, and in this case, Japanese beetle, to understand the life cycle so that you can uh, be proactive in dealing with these, uh, these Japanese beetles. And I feel your pain. Yeah. And you know what? Uh, This is not a solution for everybody, but if you can get chickens, because wow, they love Japanese beetles, they will definitely take care of not just the adults, but the grubs as well. So if that's a viable control option for you, uh, lucky you, because you'll also get eggs. Um, But again, lots to know about Japanese beetles. I will put some resources in the show notes for Anne and for anyone else who is unfortunate enough to have to deal with them. But it does take a a full-on IPM approach to... uh, to trying to manage it and absolutely oh and one other quick thing you know we could talk for hours about japanese beetles but bear in mind that uh, again if you are able to spray early enough the foliage of these plants that are most susceptible you're going to really put a dent into the problem because japanese beetles once they've attacked the plant they almost send out this signal for people, uh, additional beetles, to join the party. The problem compounds on itself. So if you can avoid it from the start, it really makes a difference too. Otherwise, your foliage becomes Swiss cheese. Bill writes to us in early April, I planted English lavender seeds for bees, but it has been the slowest growing of anything I've planted this year. I understand lavender needs consistently warm temperatures in which to grow, prefers dry conditions. Even so, two months later, anything that has sprouted is just barely above the soil. 
Yep. And then he goes on to say, what could I be doing wrong aside from maybe being impatient? And, <laughs> and well, Bill, we know patience is a virtue, especially for gardeners, but no one could blame you for being impatient. But that is really all there is to it. Uh, lavender is very, very slow to grow slow. from seed. And, you know, honestly, I am pretty impressed with the germination that you had, Bill, in, included yeah. a picture, which we can add uh, to the show notes. And I'm pretty impressed with the results he was able to get um, from growing it. I mean, sometimes when I was reading it, uh, some sources were saying that lavender will take one to three months to even germinate. Sure. Never mind start growing. So um, it is a plant that needs patience, you know, and that's not unusual for woody plants. They have to put on a lot more cells than a herbaceous plant like a tomato would. So You said the key word, woody, and I think that's why it's as slow as it yep. is. Yeah. So, you know, a little bit more patience. Fortunately, you live in a warm climate, so even if the, uh, the seedlings aren't ready to go out until fall, they'll still have a nice long time to get established in your garden. And, you know, even though it takes time and work and effort, uh, there's always something really nice to looking at a plant that you grew from seed and, and going, you know, I grew that. I, I held that when it was just a tiny little baby seed. Hang in there, Bill. Way to go. <laughs> if you have a question for us, we'd love to help you. Just email us help at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com or visit our show notes, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. You'll find pictures, resources of everything that we talk about in every single show, as well as a contact us tab. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we have a guest... Megan Matai, plant breeder for Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, so please stay tuned. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time for branching news and no better way to cultivate interest in plants. As a matter of fact, it's a kick in the plants to talk to a real plant breeder, and that's what we're doing today. Megan Matai is joining us. She's a plant breeding manager here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. And Megan, uh, welcome to the show. And the first thought that pops into my mind, and probably for lots of folks who will watch and listen to this interview, is uh, sure, you come into work, maybe have a cup of coffee, but then what does a plant breeder do during the day? <laughs> oh, I'm so excited to be here, Rick and Stacy. Um, uh, we wear many hats as plant breeders here. So basically, it's just everything from the day to day. In the summer, it is, you know, we do grab our cup of coffee and we head right out to the <laughs> greenhouse, check on our seedlings that are germinating right now. And then we just start going through the, if the trials and the evaluation. What's blooming? What are we going to look at this week? What are we going to evaluate? What should we cross? So... Kind of mm. a lot of everything. And what's that mean when you say, what should we cross? So I guess plant breeding is kind of the art of taking pollen from one plant and moving it to another plant. So that is making a cross. So we try to find and combine the best of the best. So which two plants are going to be the best parents? Or, um, you know, which plant has one attribute that we really like and we're hoping to combine it with another plant? And so you basically act like a bumblebee. Yes. Um, <laughs> I actually do have a shirt with this little bee. It says be the bee on it uh, from a, like from it. a vest. I love it. <laughs> but what do you do that with? Are you using like tweezers or paintbrushes or how are you actually doing this? A lots of different tools depending on the type of flowers that we are working with. So the art of, this is my one of my favorite, favorite term or something, but um, the art of doing this pollination is called emasculation. So we are basically taking off and removing all of the anthers from the plant that will become the mother. And then we have either stored or collected pollen that we are using paintbrushes with and to collect that pollen and then just to dab it onto the stigma of that flower. And by emasculating or taking the pollen off of the mother plant, you're making sure that it doesn't pollinate itself. Correct. And then it would just have, so you're trying to get those different genetics in there, and that's how you get a new, interesting, proven winner's color choice shrub. Exactly, yeah. So, so, like, after you have that cup of coffee in the morning, then, is it like, well, okay, let's see. Wouldn't it be cool if we took... <laughs> now, there's probably a process, right? Uh, you know, thankfully, we do have a lot of, like, creative freedom here. Oh, so I like sometimes, that. sometimes it is just that, like, oh, wow, wouldn't it be great? You know, you're wandering the greenhouse. Wouldn't it be great if we could just cross these two plants? Or so those ideas are coming with us, um, you know, at all times. We do have strategic planning crosses, you know, 
a timing, a, a planning period in the winter where we do sit down, we look at all of the crosses we made last year, what worked, what didn't work, and mm-hmm. then set forth a plan for for the following year. So it's a little bit of both. We do get that on the spot freedom, and that's you know, um, kind of our favorite. Yeah, my uh, my grandson Max likes to watch this cartoon. Uh, a stinky, dirty show or something like that. It's a garbage truck and a dump truck, you know, and they get into all kinds of trouble. But then, you know, at, at a certain point in the show, they start asking the question, what if, yeah. what if, and what if we tried this? And I would think that's uh, to a degree what a plant breeder does, right? That's a lot. Yeah. I'm, I'm very familiar with that show too. I have a four and a half year old. <laughs> what is it? That it's is the stinky, of- dirty, stinky, dump. I don't know, whatever. The yeah. stinky and dirty show. Stinky and dirty <laughs> Check show. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> but it it is yeah and sometimes you know we make those crosses and these broad ideas and they fail and they don't work and then typically that is just more motivation to try again right. or to dig deeper as to maybe why that cross didn't work um and sometimes it's just the the wrong combination of parents within that species so trying another cultivar that cross might work so what got you interested in plant breeding um that's a good question. So I was I started working at a greenhouse when I was 14. And my favorite part of the year was always the new varieties. Like, what are we going to get this year? And then as we started getting customers for that season, like the very, um, the customers that were in the know would come in and like ask for these specific cult- you know, cultivars. And it's like, oh, wow, how do they know about these? How did these cultivars get created? Wouldn't it be neat to be that person to make those cultivars? And then my interest really peaked in my undergrad, my very first semester there. I was lucky enough to get the opportunity to work on a breeding program with their ornamental flower professor, Neil Anderson. So so, uh, so, what did you major? So if someone wants to become a plant breeder, sort of what does that path look like from a school perspective? Sure. So um, a lot of the horticulture programs in universities are, are kind of going away, but I have a, a horticulture degree with a science emphasis. So a lot of universities that still have horticulture degrees, they're either, um, you can go landscape or turf science, or um, in my case, I went um, science. You could also follow the same path by going for botany. Uh, so uh, how long, so you've been here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs for 10 years, right? 11 years? 10. 10 years. And um, the first plants that you created are just starting to come out over the last couple of seasons. So how long does it take uh, to, now, of course, I know it's going to be different for annuals, fruit, shrubs, et cetera. How long does it take to develop a new plant? So like you said, it does vary. On average, our average shrub takes somewhere between six to eight years before it, you know, from cross to selection to actual introduction. So six to eight years from physical cross is what I would say. And that's going to vary. We've had a few plants that are on the docket we've had for 15 years. It took them 15 years to get introduced. So a lot of that depends on the probability of that plant. So we are really lucky. We are breeding clonally propagated crops. So once we create that one individual that has it all, we are then able to take clones off of it and propagate it. So usually one of the biggest um, hindrances and slows down that introduction is getting up quantity to to actually bring to market right yeah so patience is important and who wants a great new plant that you can't get because there's only 10 of them out there and then you create the nightclub effect everybody wants it and they can't get it and then they (laughs) lose interest and walk away we don't we definitely uh don't want that so what do you think is the hardest part of being a plant breeder it's two di- two different things. The, the biggest one is waiting. Like we're we're always waiting. So you're waiting for that one set of seed to germinate. You're waiting for your first flower. You're waiting, you know, for your next pollinations. You're waiting for that introduction. By the time you make a choice to introduce a plant, you know, we're waiting three years before we see it hit market. So waiting, I would say, is kind of one of the hardest parts of it. And then the other thing is um, is the seasonality of it. So right now you're making crosses while you're also selecting seedlings um, and you're also evaluating plants. So June, July, August are kind of our busy. um, We're doing a lot of things right now. Hmm. Well, not least of all, because you work with so many hydrangeas, right? (laughs) (laughs) Which brings up a point. So we talk hydrangeas. So being a plant breeder, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you if you have a favorite plant is there a a favorite plant that you like to work with and a favorite plant for you personally for your home garden 
Sure. Those are, um, so my favorite plant that I like to breed in house is, um, Wygelia or Deer Villa, those plants, those flowers, um, are really great to, em- to emasculate. They're large. You can work with them. You don't need a magnifying glass. Um, the anthers are big, so they're just really fun to work with. Pollination's, you know, fast, germination, easy, um, and there's just a lot of variation there, and you see it at a young age. So you see it at the time those seedlings germinate because, you know, you've got yellows and green leaves and purple leaves and everything all in that tray. So fast reward kind Mm of breeding crop. My favorite hydrangea plant that I have developed is Let's Dance Sky View. Oh, beautiful. Um, Beautiful. And that just, hydrangea is one of those things where, you know, at first when I was asked to breed hydrangea mac, I was kind of, you know, taken aback. Like, what are we going to do? They're so beautiful. So much work has already taken place in that genus. Um, But sometimes it is like just putting in the right selection criteria that makes it interesting. So we have a very, what I would consider a very stringent selection um, criteria. They need to bloom at, coming out of a frost in the, you know, in the spring. They need to re-bloom. So we're testing for that. Um, they don't, you know, so more than just developing a pretty plant. If you needed to develop a pretty plant, I've got like 3,000 we could go pick right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm surprised, like, do you find it difficult when you do have to reject plants that are really pretty but don't meet all those criteria for performance that we have in Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs? Um, are you just like used to that and kind of hardened to just saying like, oh, oh, well, that's a funny question, (laughs) Stacey. I mean, I, you know, I, I feel like it would be hard for me because, you know, when you're a plant lover, it's just like you see the good qualities in something. And even though they're not necessarily what we're looking for from a commercial perspective or to make, you know, home gardeners successful, you're still like, oh, this was so beautiful and it's never going to see the light of day. We get attached. We do get attached, um, especially after we name something. So we name something, we know it, we go through the trial and, um, and, and it, you know, it has a bad trait, a negative trait. So I've got one plant that comes to mind internally. We call it Ravenclaw. No, that will never (laughs) be a trade name, but gorgeous, gorgeous hydrangea plants, got black stems and, but it's floppy and it doesn't rebloom very well. So it's a bad plant. We don't want to give you guys bad plants, but um, sometimes bad plants become good mothers. So we do get to keep them around. We get to breed with them and try to improve those qualities. Fascinating. This is this is really fascinating. You know, I can, I can see why I'm not a plant breeder. I would I don't think I'd have the patience for it. I have tremendous respect for what you do. I you know I think I'd show up on a Thursday morning and say you know. Let's try crossing a barberry with a hydrangea today and see what happens. You know, make a Frankenstein plant. It's alive, you know, and it it doesn't work that way. I mean, there's a real discipline to breeding plants. Yeah, there definitely is. Um, And if you could cross a hydrangea and a barberry, you would be, I mean, you are famous. I'd be rich. (laughs) (laughs) So when we talk about it that way, like, okay, you know, I'm just taking the pollen from one plant and putting it on another. I mean, I know that's a vast oversimplification of what a a plant breeder does, but that is the essence of it. So, um, you know, a lot of people like to experiment with that kind of thing at home. Do you have any advice for people who are maybe dabbling in plant breeding at home? Um, Keep at it. Have fun with it. Um, Go ahead and do that. You know, that is... Essentially, that is a very interesting part. That's the art of it. That's the design, making the cross, growing out those seedlings. The next stage that is usually the most difficult then is that selection phase. So you've got a population now of 100 of your babies. You made them. You made. You put that pollen. You made that cross. Well, all 100 of your babies are probably great to you, but now you got to narrow it down to, to just choosing one or two. And that's, that's the... Um, continued art in plant breeding is the selection. So out of those hundred babies that you get from across, you know, I know this is like a Mendela, Men, Mendelian, Mendelian? Gene- <laughs> Mendelian genetics <laughs> kind of question. But um, so how many of those hundred seedlings, just using as an example, uh, would you expect to be the same or very similar to their parents? How much variation would you maybe expect to get in that cross? Again, it depends on genus. Um, some plants are, are um, extremely what you'd call heterozygous. Um, so you're going to get a huge diversity in that population. And some plants you might get almost what looks like row run um, plants where they're almost all identical and you're only getting differences in height. So again, it's, it's by plant. It's, um, 
also, you know, maybe by how inbred or hybridized a particular mother might be as well. Mm. That's fantastic. So if our listeners want some Megan Matai developed plants uh, in their gardens, you said Let's Dance Skyview mm -hmm. is one of your favorites. What are some other ones that you've developed that are on the market now? Probably my second favorite would be wine and, Wygelia Wine and Spirits. Okay, so um, that's new this New it, mail order this year in garden centers next year. Yeah. Yep. And I think it has hit a couple garden centers okay. um, this year. I was getting reports on, so it was looking really good. Um, and then my third tier would be the Lagostromia. The, um, center stage red is um, my favorite one, but the whole center stage series is, is great. And if you aren't, aren't familiar with Lagostromia, that's crepe myrtle. And I know that's a, a species you've been working on a lot because you're trying to develop a very dark foliage black crepe myrtle that didn't get powdery mildew and have all the liabilities that some of the other ones on the market had. Exactly. And, you know, and typically it's more of a southern crop for us. So it's really fun for me to breed southern crops in a northern environment because we put re even, you know, tougher um, selection criteria on onto those plants. Uh, the work you do, Megan, is fantastic. Her name is Megan Matai. She's a plant breeding manager here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. And, and Megan, you must... Uh, Really, truly, sincerely, you must really take pride. It must be enjoyable to see a plant get to the point where it makes it to market and people are enjoying the wonderful characteristics and benefits of the plant that you saw a long time ago as you developed the plant. It's got to feel great. It's an absolute dream. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Love it. Love it. Thanks for joining us on the show, Megan. It's been great having you. Thank you. Thank you. Really nice Appreciate to be here. It. Wow, that was great. That was so inspiring. Interesting. And what a wonderful person. She Just is. Great. I'm proud to call her a colleague and friend. And we want to thank you all for listening. If you have any questions, don't forget to reach out to us at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Thank you to Rick. Thank you. Thanks Stace. to Adriana. Thanks to Megan who joined us. And thanks to you for listening. Hope you have a great week.